all roads lead back to growth hormone. BPC one five seven's main mechanism is upregulation of growth hormone receptor density. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so True. when you do injectable BPC one five seven, part of your protocol should be with growth hormone. Brings us to the healing peptides, BPC-157 and TB-500. Um, I think both are eight here. Hmm. I, I think they're good. Of the peptides, they're probably the two that actually do something. I agree. Yeah, of the, all, all of the peptides, and you could consider them anabolic because they tremendously heal, uh, help in the healing process. Now, I've heard guys run this year round. I don't know if you guys know anybody that run TB500 or BBC157 year round to help with angiogenesis, reduce inflammation, um, maybe promote a little bit of recovery and at least tendon and connective tissue health. Um, and guys, if you have experience with running TB500 or BBC157 year round, let me let us know down below. I'd love to hear about it. Um, it on paper, it does make sense. And I reviewed all of the studies for BPC-157, all 190 studies. And it's all five incredible. for, for TB-500. Yeah, yeah, because it's extracted from Thymus and Beta-4. And on Thymus and Beta-4, there's thousands. Yeah. Um, so that will be a whole um, job in itself. But yeah, basically, the, the results of those five studies of uh, TB-500 concluded that it had the same healing capacity as Thymus and Beta-4. That's why a lot of these compounding pharmacies did rather just... Yeah. Run or host uh, times of beta four instead of the fragment, but apparently milligram for milligram it's exactly the same, even though it's a fragment. So, um, yeah, I think they're very promising in the context of healing injuries. Um, I, what, what is taken, your experience? I've taken I'll have it there on the shelf. I've taken oral BPC one five seven now for the last fifteen months straight. Holy moly! So, but obviously that's with celiac. And uh, so your, in, your intestinal tract is a little bit front of the bicep when you uh, give it some in, food, you're like, in, hell in, yeah. In combination with lorazotide, and I done a GI 360 stool analysis there mm. last month, two weeks after, three weeks after the show. And right. my GI 360 was spotless. So beautiful. Um, no inflammation. The only thing that I flagged on my GI 360 was a slightly raised beta glucuronidase, which. Okay for the most part, can be a good and a bad thing. So just start to address that, obviously feeding my gut more prebiotics, more mm -hmm. calcium d glucate to try and uh, Were your bilirubin levels elevated? No. Or no? No, no, so then, no. Then it's fine. It's fine. And then I mean, even a, a nuanced thing that I started to trial was L-aspartic acid was okay. what I found in the literature to be a beta-glucuronidase inhibitor. Okay. So you can get, you can get L-aspartic acid as a dietary supplement, um, has inhibiting properties and beta-glucuronidase activity in the gut. So we'll see what results come from that. But I've taken oral BPC-157 uh, between 400 to 800 micrograms now since last July. Wow. Without, without that a completely break. reverses celiacs and, and all the issues that you had. Yeah, well, my, my gut, the inflammation of my gut. Anytime I've had trace gluten exposure, mm -hmm. I've had swelling of my abdomen, but I've had no pain. Uh, the, okay. the two times I've had, you know, exposure since last year, um, like the one I have on my Instagram, I think it was from January this year. Mm -hmm. It was just a trace. We got a, a, a takeaway from an Indian restaurant. I mean, in a couple of hours, my belly was like I was nine months pregnant, but I had no, I had no pain. And I mean, okay. what I, what I put that down to was the integrity of the gut was sort of kept intact from taking the peptides. My immune system responded, but I didn't have the same excruciating pain as what I had with other exposures prior mm -hmm. to that. So, so oral BPC one five seven very good for intestinal health. I'm running it down myself because I have some intestinal issues of my own. Um, so I will continue that then because it's good to hear that it just has a building up effect. Um, I'm running 500 micrograms per day with about 500 micrograms of KPV. And it also helps with intestinal uh, health. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll continue to run that for a little bit longer because I didn't really notice much of an effect, but I guess it's a slow, um, right, it's a transitory what, effect over time. It's one of those ones, I think, like that gluten challenge where you can sort of see... Uh, whether it's doing the job or not, but uh, mm. I, I guess maybe at some point what I should do is stop and give myself six or eight weeks break. And if 
there was ever an exposure during that time, you know, what would be the difference? And touch what I don't <laughs> get an <Yeah>. exposure. <laughs> but I mean, I I've seen nothing but positive benefit from from running it last year. Um, all right. Yeah, of course, we've all done the injectable stack of the two of them together for <coughs> tendonitis or, you know, very minor muscle tears. But I guess the caveat here is we're going <laughs> to all roads lead back to growth hormone. BPC 157's main mechanism is upregulation of growth hormone receptor density. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, True. you know, when you take, when you do injectable BPC 157, part of your protocol should be with growth hormone. Yep. To, yep. You know, especially if you've got a tendon injury or a tendon repair that you're trying to facilitate. Again, putting these things locally you get some marginal effect locally, but it goes systemic because it's it's an aqueous based solution that diffuses into your bloodstream. Mm. So you don't necessarily have to put it locally. Putting it locally will allow some of it to act there first before diffusing. But the very first protocols of, oh, you have to inject as close to the 10 as possible. You know, not necessarily. Um, no, diffuses. The, yeah. the other useful thing, I guess, from reading into the mechanism of both of them, is they both upregulate and downregulate angiogenesis. So they're able to put the halt on angiogenesis to certain parts of the body and upregulate angiogenesis to others. So ah. when we're looking at, you know, people caveating potential cancer risk from this angiogenesis, BBC 157 tends to know where to upregulate hmm. blood flow delivery to and where to direct it away from. Ah, hmm. so maybe it has some anti-cancer properties. I remember reading something about this, but it was not very well researched uh, no. when I made that deep dive. No, it's not. Well, obviously, we're we're looking at animal-based studies, yeah, really, when it comes animal. to these two. But, yeah. There's uh, one uh, one retrospective human study on BPC. That's it. But I think eventually we're going to have enough anecdotal and hopefully someone will do a, a case report, like publish a case report on these peptides mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, we, we've probably all recommended the utilization of these two peptides alongside growth hormone for post-surgery, uh, post yep. uh, muscle tear, tendon rupture, etc., alongside some other useful things. And we've seen, you know, pretty dramatic recovery times where I've had, you know, people from consoles come back to me and say, oh, well, the orthopedic surgeon was quite baffled that I was able to move yeah. my elbow <laughs> yeah. six, six months, you know, six months yeah. after the surgery, let alone six weeks after the surgery. Yeah. And, it, and we hear know, these stories over and over again. Yeah. We heard it over and over again. Yeah. So I, I would say that BPC and TB500 are both are A tier, right? Again, not as good as growth hormone, but stack very well together. Yeah. With growth hormone, I st still think that they're used as contextual to kind of heal injuries or you have some tendonitis or some inflammation or, or some gut uh, problems, which is the case that BBC 157 can actually heal that over time. Um, so I can't put it in S tier, but definitely A tier. Um, and I know that if I put it any lower than that, we'll get a huge rejection and unfollows. <laughs> Because like with GSK Copper, I think everybody can agree. And, and growth hormone secreted gargs, everybody can agree for us to put it in E tier. But BPC-157 and TB-500, it healed millions of injuries worldwide. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the anecdotal evidence is vast. You know, because when they put that on um, the article 30 or 503 A and B, where they limited the compounding pharmacies from prescribing TB-500 mm -hmm. to BPC-157, that's what everybody pointed the finger to. Like, what the fuck? We need this, you know, it was even on Joe Rogan. Um, and then, you know, he's been a very big advocate of these kinds of peptides. Um, so what do, you, what do you guys think? A tier, higher, yeah. lower? Uh, hey. No, A. I mean, even like you said there, the fact that WADA have now started to yeah, place okay. it as a banned, banned substance, they, they know how useful these two compounds are. So again, yeah, it's, uh, I, I'd agree, A. Which is a shame because it has no shown performance enhancing benefits, nope. but it it shortens the time between getting an injury and being back on the field. So if anything, you're handicapping the athletes not to play more. So you're literally taking good athletes off the competition, so, which is well, that's why. Huh? 
the stupid decisions. Don't worry, I had I made a, a water <laughs> prohibited list uh, or water approved doping stack is one hour and 40 minutes long because I put mod C in the prohibited list. So I got upset. So now I, I showed them one hour and 40 minutes of options that are not included. <laughs> 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 Fucking assholes. Um, 